<laughs> Press the first race. I'm 16 years old. I never drove on the street. I was basically going to shift the car for the first time when I, as I was pulling out onto the racetrack. He went out in his first lap. He come down the back stretch and he was full bore. We went in turn three, but never came out. The car started to push a little bit, like towards the wall, and I panicked and locked the brakes up and slid right in the wall. It was probably like I don't know, maybe my fourth lap or something like that. I don't even remember. When he came in, his dad said, "I told you to run high, but not quite that high." <laughs> Hard way to get started. The 1980s were filled with entertainment, technology, and politics. Pac-Man made its debut in arcades around the country. Nintendo found its way into the homes of millions, and the Rubik's Cube kept the less tech-savvy from twiddling their thumbs. The Reagan Revolution was in full effect, and a television network called MTV helped launch careers and become household names. Launching its own group of rock stars, Orange County Speedway began to put race car drivers on the national map. Drivers like Richie Urich, the second most winningest driver in the 80s, and Jeff Hetzler with the third most wins, hammered the hard clay every Saturday night. Jeff Hetzler is like the, uh, the old professor, and, and he can tell you anything about right, right from the center of the engine all the way out to the outside of the body. He's been a good competitor. Uh, Jeff is very good, and he's very knowledgeable. The most unique thing about Jeff is he's probably one of the most hands-on guys as far as motors and cars and building cars in his day. Jeff is absolutely one of my all-time heroes. He's a guy that you can look up to in a racing world, and he's won every race. He's a good guy, Jeff. Richie's always been at the top of the game. He's always been a top driver. Yeah, he's a tough dude. You know, we had our differences. You know, we still talk almost every day, so. He's got amazing longevity to still be as competitive as he is to this day. It's in you, you know, it's, it's addictive. Uh, it's, it's hard to quit. Competition at OCFS in the 80s gave fans a variety, both in driving style and in drivers themselves. Carol Burswell, she was probably the, one of the pioneers up there for women in racing, and you know, at the time, she did very, very well. I remember walking around the pit saying, I'd like, you know, I want to drive. And uh, I think it was Jack Grimshaw. He heard me and he said, take my car out. And I started last, which I think was like 21st, and I finished 11th my first time out. Man or woman, young or old, fans witness legendary competition weekly. But one name would quickly rise to the top. Red Hearn forged his legacy by passing Frankie Schneider to become the most winningest driver in OCFS history. Talk about Frankie Schneider at Middletown, he had 58 wins or something like that, right? As I'm starting to accumulate wins, I'm thinking, wow, that's a huge number. 58 wins at one track, that's unbelievable. And to think now that I've got triple his number, um, it, just, it just blows me away. Everybody, the whole but winning in this sport is no solo act. If I can get this out, get the fuel cell out, I can get in there and weld it. Everybody wanted a JLB car, just like Brett's. But it takes more than just a piece of machinery to be a winning driver. This isn't an III sport, this is a team sport. I mean, you gotta surround yourself with good people. You don't do this by yourself. The crew has to be in line to know what they're doing. It's like the Yankees, you know, by themselves, they're really not that great, but when they're, when they're together, then they're a team and they're doing good and they're happy about it. I was my brother's crew chief from 85 to 87. I was funding my team on my own, so, you know, for me to have to pay somebody all winter long when there was no racing and no income, it was almost impossible. I had a couple of guys come to me and say, hey, you know, you build press bodies, you, would you build me a body? I had a shop and I had tools. Yeah, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Why don't you use my shop and build stuff and sell it? I would do a couple of bodies over the winter and then all of a sudden I realized more and more people were asking me to do work for him. He kept busy all winter, he got paid, and it worked out good for me because I didn't have to pay him. 
you know, it was a two or three year run we had together, but it was a very successful one. Bobby went on to start Teal Fabrications, but he wasn't the only one who built groundbreaking cars. That's when Gary Ballou came in with what they called the Batmobile. All of a sudden this car shows up and everybody realizes, oh my God, there's such a thing as this aerodynamic. Gary always says, you know, the air is free and to use it however you can. And there's a lot to gain there. We had a big advantage. Back then there wasn't many rules and nobody even thought about a rule book, really. So they found a loophole in the rules, right? Just simply the fact that the car runs about two seconds faster than they ever drove. Your car was as good as you were creative. You know, and the strive to be better and be faster. There's always a new new thing, a new trick, you know, people try to do. Well, it was a good race car, and it still is a good race car. And then, you know, the unfair advantage is always starts with money, right? So you got the most money, so that's why you're winning the most races. There's a big difference between a home-built motor and a bought motor. But it was easier. You know, buy the part, put it on the tip. They were starting with the manufactured frames. A lot of them were still old OEM-style frames with just uh, race car bodies on them. Probably the early 80s, and I started buying them because it just got to be too easy for everybody to get the same stuff you got. The burden fell on the drivers as they saw price tags rise in order to compete. If you wanted to keep up, you had to pony up. I don't know how most of them do it. They're spending a lot of money. No matter where you look, I mean, there's blue-collar guys that are, that are in the trenches doing the work, building the cars. But somewhere in there, there's a white collar type of person that's paying the bills. This is very much a blue collar sport that needs white collar money. In 1983, OCFS saw some significant changes when a new promoter took over. Glenn Donnelly came down and took over the Speedway and we became a dirt sanctioned track. Glenn unified dirt track modified racing for us and set some good purses and, and really helped the drivers become less of a ragtag group and more of an organization. Donnelly was a big promoter upstate. He ran a good show up there. Glenn was a big part of Orange County. He got the ball rolling and he brought the drivers back and he got actually things working for quite a few years there. In reaction to increased popularity and growing diversity in racing, six divisions were created to compete every Saturday night, and the crowds got even bigger. Ah, uh, yeah. There were race fans in the 80s. Well, I went to Middletown, and you look, and they have banners hanging over the fence for their drivers, you know? We have such a great racing community in this area, and it's located in a good populated area. It's easy for fans to come see. We were rock stars, man. Wherever we went, met you at the next racetrack, whether it was four hours away or not. I started coming to the races when I was a little girl with my family. Between races, look at this, the goings on. I mean, they followed you around, they started fan clubs. A lot of them had fan clubs. I had a fan club. If you joined up for somebody's fan club, you would get a little, you know, newsletter in the mail and stuff, and then some other trinkets and stuff like that. I was in Brett Hearn's fan club. I was actually in Gary Blue's fan club. I had probably one of the largest fan clubs going on since I was. But you get out in Middletown, and that's what really amazed me about racing up north. The bumping and grinding at speeds well over 200 miles per hour. It was the fan participation how they got into their racing. You know, it was just great. And with all these races taking place, Brett Hearn was winning the majority of them. My first memory of Orange County Fair Speedway was Fried Doe and Brett Hearn winning the feature. They call Brett Hearn the Jet, and he's hoping for a takeoff and a perfect landing in Victory Lane tonight at Orange County. That car that we had started, started with was very primitive. It was a car that wasn't expected to do very well. The first time I've seen Brett Hearn make a lap or two, you just know that he would be good. Red drives the car, he's one of the best in the business. If you would say Orange County history, you know, there's only one number one. That's my brother. He'd race hard, but he always had a real good balance on that race at heart, I'm not reckoning. He was winning a lot of races. We had a, a crazy year that we, we basically won almost every race. We got a lot of second places for that man. Never really understood why people booed him, but they did. Everyone was patting you on the back on the way up. Once you got to the top, they didn't like that. You know, when you win, people don't like it. We'll take a look now at the Super Dirt Series driver points, and Brett Hearn continues to lead the way. He would get to the winner's circle, which was quite often, and they would let him know. They would let him know they, they didn't like him, and you'd have the same amount of people trying to butt in you know, to cheer him on. You really knew that Brett had a hold of the, the place, and he had a hold of the game. 
he was quickly becoming the Michael Jordan of Middletown and, and racing. There's been no other decade of dominance like Hearn showed in the 80s, but his career was still young, and an impending rivalry is about to take shape in what some fans consider the best decade of racing in OCFS history.